Hi, welcome to our interview show in which we interview LGBTQ guests who are important contributors to our community. We want to acknowledge that All Things LGBTQ is produced at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which is unceded indigenous land. Enjoy the show. Hi, everybody. I'm here with two friends of the show, uh, John Kalecki and Donna Ann McAdams. They're making return visits. And uh, Donna came nine months ago, and John has come several times, most recently five months ago. And they've been up to a lot since we talked last. So I'd like to, if I may, uh, tell you, just review their bios, their short bios, because they do much more than a simple bio um, would indicate. And then we'll talk a little about Donna's show that's been touring the state, Performative Acts, and uh, John's activities as a curator. So let's start with John Kalecki, who is currently a legislator in the Vermont House of Representatives. Previously, he served as executive director of the Flynn Center for the Performing Arts, program officer for arts and culture for the San Francisco Foundation, executive director of the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, and curator of performing arts for the Walker Arts Center. Other past positions include program officer at the Pew Charitable Trusts, general manager of PepsiCo Summer Fair, and managing director of the Trisha Brown and Laura Dean Dance Companies. His recent Vimeo elegies will appear on Vermont PBS on April 20th at 9 p.m. So I encourage you to tune in and see that. It's a very moving Vimeo. The first time I cried all through it, the second time I didn't and appreciated the art. Thank you. Um, Donna McAdams, another luminary on the show. Uh, Donna was born in Queens in 1954. You're younger than I am. And you grew up in a town that interviewers have trouble, trouble pronouncing, Lake Run, Kakoma. Well, Kakoma, close enough. Okay. Uh, you studied photography at, San, at the San Francisco Art Institute, got an MFA in visual arts from Rutgers, and a BA in cultural anthropology from Empire State College. A little more about Donna. Since 1983, McAdams has been, well, let me just speak in the second person. You've been committed to bringing cameras and photography into marginalized and underserved communities. You've built community dark rooms and taught photography inside New York City homeless shelters and day programs for people living with severe mental illness. Um, you've also taken photographs and worked on the back stretch of a thoroughbred racetrack and inside a small farming community in West Virginia. In 2010, you collaborated with Maurice Sendek and Lynn Capernera to establish the Sendek Fellowship, a residency program for people who tell stories with illustration. Donna lives on a goat dairy farm in southwestern Vermont, Sandhurst. Sandgate. Sandgate. I want to come and visit Sandgate and meet the goats. I'm not the goat. Come on, Ann, not the goat. Okay, so can you speak up a little? Yes, come milk a goat. All right, you have five now? Oh, no, Donna has a lot more than that. Five. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I have, I have 11 goats, adult goats. I have seven goats in milk. And I have 13 babies on the ground, 10 bucklings and um, three redolings. Very impressive. 13, yes. You are a serious dairy farmer. And they all need help. 
Say what? Well, we're the smallest licensed dairy. We're the smallest licensed dairy in the state of Vermont, they say. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, sounds big to me. Let's start with John, if I may. Um, he ident one of his many identifiers is as a curator. Um, and you curated Donna's exhibit, of course. Tell me, what does a curator do? Well, I, I, over, over my career, I've worked at the Walker Art Center and the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, and we had galleries there. And so, you know, uh, I, I did some curation in both of those institutions, um, as well as at the Flynn Center, we had a gallery. And so for five years, I did the curating of um, shows uh, about every two months, so about six shows a year. And you, you know, a curator picks the artists, you sort of pick the themes if it's a group show, you select the work, you, you really think about what's, what's a way to frame work about an artist, about a theme, about a time. And um, I encountered Donna's work, but, but we've known each other for 40 years. But since I moved to Vermont in 2010, she did a great show um, with the Vermont Folklife Center, a Tales from the Backstretch, I think is what it was called. And we had that at the Flynn Center. And then I had a group show called um, Animal Power. And I asked Donna, did she have anything? She, she loves working animals, you know, whether it's horses at the racetrack. And, and she had just, um, so she had gone into um, Green Mountain College in Pulteney when they had a pair of oxen, working oxen. And one of them had gotten injured and they were gonna have to put the, the oxen down. And there's a lot of issues about that. So Donna, of course, went up um, to the, the college to kind of, and <laughs> <laughs> to, to capture the moment. But in pure Donna fashion, she goes into the field with these huge oxen and she did this beautiful diptych. So I, I used that in, um, in the Animal Power show uh, that I had put together. And then in January, 2018, I called Donna and I said, you know, Vermont doesn't really know how important you are, how central you are, how seminal, you, seminal you've been to kind of queer liberation, and the avant-garde in this, the 80s and 90s in New York. And it's really important. And I would like to see if I could, I'm gonna be retiring from the Flynn, I'd like to put together a retrospective show of, of yours and to see if anyone's would be interested in Vermont. Because I think it's important that if we look at your avant-garde performance work, your queer liberation work, your work with people with mental illness, uh, rural farmers, and also the life that she has with her husband, with her goats um, on their farm in Sandgate. You know, there they are living in Sandgate, Vermont with what, 250 people um, and no one knows about her. And in New York, I mean, just in May, PS122 is gonna be having its 40th anniversary and they're honoring Donna because she was their house photographer for 23 years. And so I felt like we have one of the, most important photographers living in social documentary, alive here in Vermont, and people don't know her. So um, that began the journey of the show three years ago. Uh, and it's been such a pleasure to work with my friend, Donna Ann McAdams, because um, we share an aesthetic, uh, we share a politics and uh, we share so much life history together. I mean, we, we were both, we didn't know each other then, we were both living in San Francisco the night Harvey Milk was assassinated. And so to, to land together, and I think one of the things a curator does is you're allowed to tell your own story through artists. And there's just been such a deep connection uh, to Donna's work. So it's been just a, an honor to work with her. So you, as a curator, you choose themes and do you arrange the paintings? Well, I would say I'm going to bring Donna into the conversation now because it really, um, you know, it is something to walk into someone's archives, an artist's archives of 45 years of work. And we didn't start with a title. We started thinking about, well, what are the different bodies of work? And, and Donna and I would have conversations and then we'd look at work together. She, she's had many books and catalogs of her work. So we looked at the catalogs, but then sitting in her studio, it's so profound when someone opens a drawer and there's a box 
you know, and Donna will pull out this box. Oh, let's look in here. And so we went on a journey together. Um, and we knew we were going to do the performance work, of course, because that's pretty important work. And I think we realized also that the AIDS related work, the ACT UP work, the LGBT marching against don't ask, don't tell issues, the early lesbian, the dyke marches and things. This was a history that people didn't really remember or know. And so we thought that was important, but it wasn't until we got to the animals <laughs> that performative acts like, oh, I think that's what we can call it. And we, so then we had an organizing theme. And well, I, I don't know, Donna, maybe you should describe how it was for you to have people poking around in those boxes in your archives. It's really amazing when you think about the fact that we were both in San Francisco in November in 1977. I think it's not 70 anyway at the same time and it, the trouble that we could the good trouble if I might uh, appropriate an expression we could have gotten into um, but uh, I think that both of our sensibilities were shaped by that early movement in San Francisco so to have somebody like John who I didn't who I got to know really well during the culture wars in the early 90s come into my studio, which is, it's like somebody going through your, your, you know, underwear drawer, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that you may or may not uh, be willing to show or share, but I, I felt so, so comfortable and, and the trust and the enthusiasm and the interest. It was, it was a pleasure to be able to just show and share things that I wasn't sure about, or I didn't really know about, or I didn't have a sense of whether or not they were good or not. So it was, it was a real pleasure to have somebody with, this, with fresh eyes. It's always nice to have fresh eyes look at your work. Even yeah. if they don't like it, they always will tell you, teach you, or say something that you didn't know or you, you didn't realize, and it's always, it's always a great experience, whether it's in your archive, in your studio, or whether it's on the wall in a, a museum or a gallery or a, a library, anytime people look at your work, it's, it's a great experience. Well, let's step back. When did you meet, Ben? You've been friends at least 40 years, 45 years? Uh, uh, no, we've, we, I've known Donna for 40 years because she, yeah. when she was the house photographer for, for PS122, she'd actually be sitting on the edge of the stage and I'd be in the audience because I was uh, a curator at that point at the Walker Art Center. And so I'd be going to see shows and I wanted to see what was the you know, because it was the place for the avant-garde. And so I'd be seeing these shows and I thought, who is this strange woman with her Leica camera just right there? Um, and it was always her photographs that would be in the New York Times or the Village Voice the next day in the review, you know? And so what happened was um, I didn't know her, I knew her work. And then when the artists came to the Walker Art Center or other places I presented them, of course they used her photography because they really loved the way she photographed them. Um, and a lot of it wasn't staged or posed. It was really action shots, you know, that they, they would, artists, she would photograph the artists in performance or in a dress rehearsal or something. And it was really, it just, they were so visceral and they were so kinetic and it was, they, they had a pulse to them off, off the page. And it, so it was then during 1990, I presented Karen Finley and uh, that started the culture wars, that a review of the show at the Walker got Jesse Helms all upset, the Senator, and that started. And suddenly Holly Hughes, Tim Miller, uh, David Warnanovich, Ron Athey, all of these artists Donna had photographed and all of these artists we were getting um, slammed um, in, at the Walker where I was. And so it became, talking to Donna and other people about these artists to kind of protect them from being de de demonized and sensationalized from like radical right-wing media. Okay, let me pause. Let me, let me just oh. say one thing. Even though we didn't know each other, we knew each other because I knew John was curating all of my friends. But John, we did, I, we met at, for the first time, I think at PS122 
you came to see a young artist who was dancing on crutches. Oh, yes. Space. And that was the first, and I was shooting the dress rehearsal, and that was the first time that, we, that I actually got to meet you. And I'm not sure what year that was. Well, so, but amazing you know, I, was I, I made a film with, with him. Yes. It was Crutchmaster. So I probably was sitting in the back with my camera. Yeah, well, yeah, but you, he was very nervous. And yes. you, you were really, really helping to have him find his way in the space. And, and I think your presence and your, who you are helped that evening be incredibly successful and let him experience something that he knew he had, but he hadn't had a sense that he had. So yeah. that was the first time I actually met you in the okay. downstairs space as, at PS122. Let's pause for a moment. Uh, let me recommend Donna's uh, wonderful website that we'll show the link to. And John and Donna have a great conversation on it about the culture wars. And let's now switch, let's now look at one of the photos from uh, PS122, Martyrs and Saints of Ron Elthy. Elthy? Elthy. Elthy. Can you tell us a little about this, Donna? It's a very intense photo. Um, it's, it's uh, Ron was performing at PS122 in the upstairs space, and he had himself, um, it was Saint Sebastian and he, he with, with piercings on one of, the, one of the beautiful white columns that I always would like to include in any photograph that I was able, if I could, while I was performing. He, he attached himself to that. But I think John, who knows, who's curated Ron and has done multiple conversations with him, would be the absolute best person to talk about Ron's work, I, I think as opposed to me. John. Well, Anne, what's, what's great is it's, we, we, we share this history with the Karen Finleys, the Ron Athees, the Holly Hughes, the David Warnanovich. We could each go back and forth with stories, but right. with Ron, um, he had actually performed in Minneapolis before coming to PS122 for that show. And that had set off a firestorm because one of the visual arts critics who did not come to the show, in fact, heard about Ron's show and three weeks after the event wrote this sensationalized review of a show she hadn't seen. It was outrageous. And so that then became the fodder of, oh, look what these artists are doing with National Endowment for the Arts Money. And this is so inappropriate. And then his next performance was at PS122. So of course, all the media was very interested in, in getting images of this radical artist now, and, and Donna was taking the images. So it was, it was wonderful to watch her navigate this. But to give you a little context of Ron, and then Donna can tell you the stories about photographing Ron. Um, he, he had a really interesting life. He grew up in a, a Pentecostal tent show family. And his, um, his mother and his aunt, and I think probably his grandmother were schizophrenic and they had very unstable life together but they would bring Ron to the tent shows. And early on, around the age of eight, he would start speaking in tongues and dancing in these tent shows. And he became known as one of these Pentecostal healers. Um, and it was very odd for a young kid to do that. And he, he's living in Los, in Los Angeles. Well, as he grew up, he, got, he became much more a, of a punk in the, in the punk aesthetics. And then he also be, uh, got into the leather and bondage scene in, in Los Angeles. And he, he became a junkie. Uh, and so his work is interesting because it really deals with all of these issues in his life. It deals with redemption. It deals with healing from addiction. It deals with the bondage issues of what the limits are in persons and it deals with religious iconography. So the picture that you're, you were showing is actually a St. Sebastian picture on purpose, because in that picture, of course, Sebastian was pierced. And mm -hmm. so in this um, particular performance moment, Ron is, is pierced in, in the side 
you know, or earlier in, in the same show, there's a crown of thorns that's put on Ron's head. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever gotten acupuncture, but it's like acupuncture needles. It, it hurts a little bit, but not that much, but then there is blood. And so, but it's this thing of, to remember the nineties, body fluids were very frightening and very scary. So it's people like Ron Athey were pushing it, saying we are, we are washed in the blood. And this was 1993, you see. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so then, 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 then he comes to New York and the media is waiting for Donna's images. So Donna, you should take over there now, I think. Well, all during the culture wars, uh, the media and the press following cues from Helms and his, his, his band of renowns were looking for pictures that would illustrate his point. And my responsibility was first to the artist, always to the artist, to, to represent them in the best possible light and in the light they'd like to be seen in. And also at that time, people like John and I and all, all, the, all the artists in all of the performing and, and galleries were, we were the triage unit for the National Endowment for the Arts. So we, 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 would want, we wanted to present work that would not give them the media, the writers, any opportunity to take a photograph out of context, which they would do regardless. But if they had photographs like Ron uh, looking beautiful, St. Sebastian, St. Sebastian, uh, you know, it would be a lot harder for them to prove their point with my visuals, which did not make them happy. But it was the way, that's how I've always been with permission, I'm not gonna cash in, I'm not gonna, you can't pay me enough money to put out a photograph that would not make me happy or would not, that would be used against these, these artists and the work that they're creating for the communities that we lived in. I wasn't gonna do it. So I did something else. I'm, I'm proud of that. Yes, well, let's switch gears and go back uh, five years to uh, the Wow Cafe. This is my request that we include this photo of Paradise Lost at the Wow Cafe in 1988. This is in your exhibit, of course. Tell us about this. Well, you know, there, I, I love this photograph for so many reasons because all of my friends are in it. And when I was asked to, well, John also wanted to include this photograph in performative acts too, because, because of the Wow Cafe and because of, of, because of women and because of lesbians and because of our, that, that particular community. And the Wow Cafe uh, is such a, was such and is still a magical place. So um, I was asked to also be in a show called Art After Stonewall and uh, the curators, had an idea about what they wanted to use. And in that particular show, I also wanted to include this photograph. So I asked Peggy Shaw, who's one of the members of um, Split Riches, along with Lois Weaver and Lori Sy to let me go to the, I was down, it was 2017, I was in town for some reason, and I wanted to go inside the space. I wanted to look at the buzzers in the front of the building, I wanted to get buzzed in and I wanted to climb up and be in the, in the theater. So I could write this little piece about how important the WOW Cafe was for somebody like me. And so I climbed the 50 steps to the fourth floor and sat in the space and uh, was able to sort of have a clearer sense about how important that space was for me. It was, it was a place that you could go where you were safe, where you could laugh, where you could have fun, where you would, you would cry, if you, you, would, you would laugh, you would cry. And it was like church. It was, a, it was a really special place for me. Not like my home space, PS122, where I had a responsibility. I, I had a different kind of responsibility at the Wild Cafe. I had a responsibility to my sisters and to myself, but it was more of a joyous thing. So I just went because I felt like it. I wasn't paid, but I was, I got a ticket and I got to sit in the front and I got to do what I did. And 
I'm happy that I have done that because I I photograph quite a few performances now. So, and I have good friends that performed and came in and out of that. Deb Margolin, Peggy Shaw, Lois Weaver, Holly Hughes, Sharon Dean Smith, Lisa Crone, Peggy Healy, I mean, Mo Angelis, a ton of women who were, were important to me in, in the 80s and into the 90s. So He interviewed Eva Wise a, on the show. I didn't oh, mean to Eva, Eva Wise, Eva, great photographer. Eva Wise, great photographer. Also was in The Lady Dick, which I think might've been the first performance that I'd shot there, uh, Holly Hughes's piece, but many, many, many performances. I was privileged to witness and document. Well, let's switch back to the show traveling around the state. Performative Acts has been in Brattleboro, Castleton in Rutland, Catamount Arts, Helen Day, where I was privileged enough to see it in person. Um, and Burlington, and now it's in Bennington at the Bennington Museum, uh, yes. where it is going to be showing until August 15th. And then you're going to New York to the Howell Gallery on the Lower East Side? Well, yeah. you know, that was, that was pre-pandemic. Um, and now the pandemic closed that gallery down for a whole year. And so that's sort of off the table uh, in the short-term calendar at this point. Uh, you know, the pandemic just changed things as, as, as well. So many, so many things. So uh, actually Bennington was not on the original itinerary and then it, it became coming home because it's just 12 miles from Donna's uh, farm. So it's, it's really great that it's, it's there. It's the whole you know, the conversation you two were just having about the Wild Cafe is really, I think one of the importance of having this show is that those women those theater artists, I mean, you know, Lisa Crone, who's now a Tony Award winning, um, you know, Broadway star, basically had her beginnings there at the Wild Cafe. And so Donna's early photographs of these seminal artists are really important with not only the, a lot of the women who are written out of history in the avant-garde performance world, Donna has them, but also when we look at all the gay men that died, Absolutely. And she, she has the David Warrenoviches, she has the John Burns, she has so many people. As we went through his archives and we saw how many great artists there were, you know, uh, imagine if they all were alive today. But a at, in another yeah, one of your photographs. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and so that was a really an honor to go through that with Donna. Um, mm -hmm. What was fun though is that we didn't just wanted to be about the performance work. We just didn't want it just to be out her ACT UP AIDS activism. And she has some great photographs around ACT UP actions that she was right there in the middle of. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that the work she did um, with, with people living with mental illness was involved with, uh, you know, and also it was important for it to be current. So when we opened in Brattleboro, uh, in June of uh, 2019, um, we included a, a photo of Christine Hallquist because Christine. I was going to just ask about that. Let's put it up. Okay, so Donna, why don't you talk about this this particular photograph? Well, how wonderful to hear the news that Christine was going to be the Democratic candidate <laughs> in the state of Vermont. How uh, wonderful is that? So I thought, you know, I was doing the show and I mean, and we, were, we had, we knew we had a sense of what it was going to look like. So I, I knew, I knew that I needed to, I didn't need to do anything. I was pretty, pretty okay with what I had, but I wanted to do, to have two photographs that were new. So I went to, for, I went, I called John and I said, what do I do? And John said, oh, just call this number and come down for, come up, not down, for the pride parade. And I'm sure, you know, it'll be perfect. Yeah, you can do that. And I'm used to um, having a lot more security and a lot tighter restrictions on access. But so I called the press person and they were like, yeah, sure. Come to the parking lot. Um, I don't remember exactly where it was. and. 
and I'm standing there and then Christine walks in, hey, how are you? So I just was able to, you know, meet her and ha have a conversation and she knew what I was doing and part of the parade. And it was such a beautiful parade because the parade in New York is just, it's so big and it's so, it's not the same. And this was just, it was the people, it was the community and it was small and it was intimate and everybody knew each other. And it was, it was really wonderful. So it was a really great opportunity for me to be able to do that. And I also went to Washington with Rosie O'Donnell to, to, um, to um, sing with a bunch of Broadway people in front of the um, White House. Uh, so those were the two photographs, the new photographs that were included in this show, only because John decided that they were good enough because they have to be good. They can't just be of something. They have to actually be good photographs too. And, and Christine came to the opening in Brattleboro, which was just so, so great. You know, I hadn't seen her and, and John suggested that I make a, a copy of one of the prints and make, give it to her as a present. And I thought, oh, sure, that's a great idea. So we made a little presentation of that photograph from that show to her at the opening. It was great, you know, for her to be there and for people to meet her and for my friends to meet her and for, it was just really nice that she bothered to come. And, uh, well, she's very accessible. If I just may talk about all things LGBTQ, the first interview after she declared was on our show. Of course, it was supplanted right. by CNN and other more famous venues. But, you know, she's a great force in the community. Oh, yeah. Uh, she is. And Becca Ballant was there at the opening in Brattleboro. It, it was just great. But what was fun, you know, Anne, as we toured this show around, um, the next stop was going to be in Rutland at the Castle uh, Gallery in downtown Rutland in the old bank there. And each of the curators of the shows chose which images they liked for marketing. And it was there that they chose one of the grooms that Donna had taken because she, um, when Saratoga Racetrack is in session, I think, what, for eight years or so, Donna? No, like 14. 14. <laughs> or she, she goes every week and she photographs. But she photographs the backstretch workers, the unknown people, not, not the fancy people betting the horses. And there was this one image that made it with the show. Um, it was really important because if I understand this right, Donna, that the man had passed away, but his family was so impressed that he was in your show, he was in a gallery and they just loved the postcard. Well, let me um, introduce the yeah. picture, if I may. Roger Tootie holding Kyan and Leroy yes. at the Oklahoma training track in Saratoga in yeah. 2010. Yeah, Great. and Tootie, fabulous. Tootie is still with us, but he's not. He's not as he's not well. So okay. But so, and the thing that's great, the thing that's wonderful about. That, that letting people decide which image, which is giving them, you know, the a perspective for what they think. I mean, I like to do that. It's collaborative. And John, of course, is the same. But what I got to do in that building was in the front of the building, they had these two little windows that um, like, they were sort of like display cases. And I asked Oliver, who was the, it's his space. I told him that I had 200 used aluminum racing shoes from the racetrack that I've used in installations before. And I said, would it be okay if I brought these shoes and dumped them in, the fr in these two windows? So that, you know, and, and have a little information about a racing plate so that people could have a little education about what, what horses run on, what the shoes are made of, why they're made the certain way that they're made. How did the nails go in? So they had picked that photograph, but it wasn't until John and I saw the space for the first time that we looked and saw those two little spaces that I thought, oh, this is good. So we dumped, yeah, 200 shoes uh, <laughs> in, the, in the windows. It's, and I, I don't know if you know the building, it's an old bank. 
And so, but the problem is it's an old bank. And so all, all the windows are there and galleries don't usually have a lot of windows. And these are silver gelatin and black and white prints, right? So it's like light goes on them and they would fade within a 48 hours or so, you know, it would be like, it would destroy the photograph. So Donna and Oliver, the, the curator down there, they, we had to put black paper over all the windows to protect the work. And hey, Oliver was great about it. Oh, he's a sweet man. Yeah, to totally great. Well, let's turn to another contemporary image of a Black Lives Matter march. You've been busy during the pandemic. You certainly, you've been showing everywhere, but you've been taking a lot of new photographs. Is that right, Donna? Well, actually, in 2020, I, I shot, I, made, I, I exposed 30 rolls of film. In 2019, I shot 175. In 2018, I shot 145. And, okay. And going, f so no. <laughs> <laughs> I, that, I went to that because a friend was organizing it with a bunch of young women who had, who, who set that up. So I was, in, that's probably the only really live event that I went to besides my, my, my father-in-law's unveiling in February of 2020. So no, I, that, and I, I'm really, that was the only time I sort of really went out in the world because I, I just, my community was shut down. I wasn't able to photograph the way I wanted to photograph. And honestly, I just wasn't, I don't know. I just wasn't interested in taking pictures of people with masks on for some reason except in the context of this, this, this protest. I thought, you know, that it didn't really matter that I didn't care, but I, I wasn't really, I didn't feel like doing that kind of, that kind of work. And, and I, so I didn't really shoot. I didn't have my community, my people. But, but, you know, and what was fun is that, you know, this was the, if that, that particular photograph you're mentioning, Black Lives Matter is one of the two new ones we brought into the Bennington Museum because as the show toured, the, each of the galleries were different in size and what we could have. And so I think you said you saw it at Helen Day in Stowe. And so we added seven photographs there um, that weren't in the show in Bennington because there was more space in, in, in Stowe. And w one from Donna's archives for the, for in the Helen Day Center in Stowe was 9-11. Mm -hmm. Donna was in New York living there at that time. And, um, so she got one with the World, World Trade Centers actually on fire. Um, it's an incredible image that she caught. And, and when we did a, Donna and I did on Zoom, a, a visit with some of the school kids from Stowe. And that is the photograph that the kids wanted to talk about. And they kept saying to Donna, were you scared that day? It's really interesting, like that, that, that one resonated, not Ron Athea, St. Sebastian, it was, it was this one. Um, so, and when we went to Bennington. Let's show it. And the, um, it's striking because the, you could see the flames in the background, but it's not in the center. And in your art, you talk about framing and how that's particularly uh, an artistic thing to do, I'm not, I don't know enough about photography to ask an informed question here, but can you talk about the, the framing and then it's not in the center? Well, I'm, I'm really interested in the edge, the photograph. I'm actually, my influences come from illustration, mm -hmm. uh, particularly um, er, early illustrations, cartoons. Mm -hmm. And so I, I like to, um, I'm not, I like to sort of work that the and I like interruption in the frame too, mm -hmm. and so when I managed to get out of jury duty, and get my camera out of the lockbox on the ground floor as they were evacuating the building, and I backed up and I saw what was happening, and I decided that I was going to go down to the go down there because that's what you do, and then the first tower fell, and then I thought, oh, that's not what you do. So I made my way back up. Broadway 
And at Canal Street, I stood back and I saw, well, actually the tower hadn't fallen, fallen yet, but I think I, 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 I talked to Brad on the phone and he said, don't go down there. That's what happened. He said, do not. And he had no idea. He had to turn on the, the radio. And when I was standing on the corner of Canal and Broadway, I looked and the towers were in the background and there was this advertisement for an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, Collateral Damage. And I just looked at that and I thought, oh my God. And so I, I made that photograph. I mean, I have pictures of people running farther away, up Canal Street, up Broadway, of the oh, towers sure. falling, go, going down. But um, I never really showed any of those photographs. This is the first time that I actually thought about um, showing that, uh, making it public. It is on my website, though. I, I decided what the heck. But mm -hmm. uh, it was, that was a tricky photograph because it's so, it's heavy. It's, you know, it's, it, oh. is it exploitive? Am I cashing in on the, the advertisement for the movie? Am I on stake? People died there. That's a burial place. I mean, they're, it, it's sacred ground. There's 3,000 mm -hmm. lives in that space. So it was, it was an interesting and tricky and confusing, but I did it. And, and I'm, I'm glad that I did. Um, it was, you know, it, it, it actually took some convincing. The curator uh, had to convince the artist to actually show it uh, because it is such a powerful image. And that yeah. resonated with the elementary school students. That's the one that res it was fascinating. Um, just as uh, we mentioned the Karen Finley, Don had never shown that, that photograph in public either since no. 1990. So as we put this show together and, you know, of course, the first thing she did was call Karen to make sure it was okay. And it, 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 of course it was uh, because Donna never really wanted to exploit right. or sensationalize any of this work. No. So, but, but I mentioned this because now that we're at home and Donna's home in Bennington, <laughs> we said, well, wh what is there about Bennington that, would, that we could bring to Bennington? Um, and it was the Black Lives Matter photograph, which is just across the st state lines as well as Donna has a great photograph of an, an old farmer in Sandgate. Um, you, will you describe it, Donna? Well, we, we added, we, we, as we like to do, as my curator in, insists on bringing making things relevant, making them contemporary. So I had I, the Black Lives Matter photograph, which I think is a good photograph. Mm -hmm. So we have that, that re represents 2020. And then, um, we decided, John said, well, what else? What do you think? And I have a photograph of Junior Bentley. He's driving some horses with a little, a little, little cult, a little American cream following his mother who is harnessed to the, the cart uh, in that show. And we also have a photograph of, of uh, Jesse Rocco, who's a farmer who lives down the road from me. Well, so does Junior. They're both residents of my hometown. They're both residents of Sandgate. One who's gone and one who's, who sells potatoes and corn at the market in Bennington. So when we met with Jamie, John and I, and to see the space, I brought some work because uh, just so he could see what it looked like. And, we sh and I had that photograph. I had just made it and printed it. And he immediately recognized him and said, oh, that's the potato guy. And so John was like, oh, the potato guy. Yes, he's built. I guess he's going to be in the show. And I, I love that photograph because he's he's there with his horse. I think it's Minerva is 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 the is the the cow. She's a Jersey and she just freshened and there's a little teeny baby little calf in in a pile, you know, in front of him. And he's kind of half covered in the cow is kind of peeking out of the dark barn. So it's I, I, I like that photograph very much. So, yeah. So we have three new pictures for Bennington. Now that we're back at the farm, I'd like to quote you to yourself, Donna, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, at a Vermont Council Arts Council interview, they asked, what is something about your art that has changed over time? You said, my work has become more intimate and personal. I work more closely with animals and the land. My relationship to my work is a direct result of my working alongside alongside horses, goats, and neighboring farmers. Now I'd like to switch 
to Northern Spy Farm in 2007 to see a picture of your husband, who uh, aforementioned, uh, in a wonderful photo called Goat Song. Can you tell us? It's like he's communing with the goat. It's wonderful. He Can is. you tell us about it? Yeah, well, that goat, that's Lizzie. Uh -huh. She's, if you've read Goat Song, she's, she's one of the four original goats. She's one of the four original goats that we got when we first brought our goats here. And he, she was a very special goat to everybody, but in particular to Brad. He, he loved her very, very much. And she and him, well, we all have connections with animals in different ways, but Lizzie was, um, and you know, as all of our all of our does, all of them, they're all really special. But as she was the herd maker, from her are a line of goats right down to like the fourth or fifth generation of her her daughters are with us. In fact, this year, last year we kept um, uh, two years ago we kept Harvey Milk out of our goat named Zlata, and this year we kept another doe from Zlata, who is you know, comes from Wiki, comes from that whole line of, of lady goats. And um, we're keeping a little doling this year. I, I think her name is going to be Freddie Mercury. So I think Lizzie is no longer with us? No, Lizzie passed away for, she was probably 12 when she left. And the, on the ground now in the retirement zone, we have um, Jewel, who's 13. Tilly, we lost this year. Uh, she was 14. Wicca, we lost. She was 12. And Foyt, who's 11. So there's 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 a little retirement community, and the, those retired goats raise the babies. And it's so it's really nice to see. If only we could learn as as human beings how important the elders of our community are. Here are these old goats raising the babies. Why can't we do that? Why can't we bring our old together with the young? I mean, why do we, it, it's just, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me when you can see it, you see it here. We could learn so much from animals if only we'd pay attention and listen, so. Well, anyway. Lizzie is memorialized in a photograph. <laughs> yes. Um, and speaking of goats and the farm, in one of the interviews that, uh, a fabulous interview that you and John did at Catamount, Arts Library. Um, you talked about learning a Swedish um, goat call from Meredith Monk. And you were kind enough to share it with the live audience at the library. And I was wondering if you would be kind enough to share it with us. It was lovely and euphonious. Okay. Um, well, John and I have a special connection to Meredith Monk. Uh, I mean, he, he brought her to the, to the walker. She, Meredith is, um, rides. She knows about horses. In her studio, there's a photograph that I gave her in the early 90s. It's one of the, one of the only works of art that, um, uh, is not necessarily hers or in relationship to who her sensibility, it's in there. And um, when I first came to New York uh, from San Francisco, I went to a performance um, at St. Mark's Church with a, a dancer and friend, Aldona Regulus. And she was doing the Plateau series number two. And um, the, this, this riff that it's it, this riff that she, had this improv improvisational movement, but also voice, which is what she, she does often in her work, really stuck by me. And so when I got my goats and Brad started to research for goat song and we started to look at, you know, how do people get animals to come in? How do they call them? How, what, what's the relationship? I decided to, uh, to use this monk riff and it's not exactly what Meredith did, but you know, I've never done it in front of Meredith. Uh, but uh, I'd have to sort of, let me see how I can get into, John, do you have anything to say about Meredith as I prepare? Well, and we also have a picture we could show of her uh, at PS 122 
doing volcano songs. Yes, yes, yes. 1994. Let's show that while you compose yourself. Okay. Well, uh, you know, uh, and that that again, this is a shared history with volcano songs. I had commissioned Meredith to do an opera called Atlas, uh, and it was with the Houston Grand Opera and the Walker. And I actually have on my arm a tattoo from Atlas, an image of a horse that is up from, from Meredith's horse. Um, so that was, uh, uh, but after, after Atlas, she'd worked five years on this huge opera piece. And uh, she, it actually was just remounted in Los Angeles two years ago to great acclaim. And it, it's, a, it's a really great work. Um, but she said, I just want to go into the studio and start over. I don't want to have a project in mind. I can't, you know, I can't figure out the project before. And so I said, okay, well, let's see if we can raise money for you just to begin again. And so we did. And it, uh, she, we got a little bit of money together and the piece was a solo and it was called Volcano Songs. And the photo in this exhibition that's touring right now through the state has Meredith in that solo format in Volcano Songs. So there's, there's almost all of these artists we could talk back and forth on, but let's hear Meredith Monk's goat songs now. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fabulous, if I were a goat, I'd come running. My cat just went running. <laughs> Well, this has been a great conversation. Is there anything you want to add? We have a few more minutes. Well, Anne, I could make you very jealous, by the way. Okay. Because um, I've been down to the goat farm a number of times. And oh, uh, I there, going, John. there was, she had a new baby boy born and they don't keep the boys around very much on the farm because it's a dairy, right? So they keep the girls and they sell the boys. But they decided this one boy was so sweet. And so they, they were going to castrate him and keep him. And I said, oh, name him after me, name him John, Johnny Ray. And so <laughs> they have a little, what do you call him? You don't call him a boy goat. He's a weather. A weather. He's so a weather. anyway, Johnny Ray lives on the farm. And, and of course, Brad, her husband, thought it was Johnny Ray the singer that he, <laughs> he didn't even know who it was named after. So I have a goat named after me, Anne. Just saying, okay? I am very impressed. Okay. Well, we'll have to come down and visit the farm and Johnny yeah. Ray. Johnny and, Ray. Yeah. And what, the archives are in a separate building there, Anne. So when you go visit Sandgate, the farm, after you visit the goats, make sure you go into Donna's exhibit and you can just say let's look at some of the early history of some of the early um dyke marches and is it dyke nation right dyke nation it was and the lesbian avengers she has such an archive of photograph of women at that early part of the movement that you will be just in heaven you'll be delirious so yeah i mean i was i was lucky enough to photograph the first dyke march in washington dc in 1993 no and Lori and I went out at Lori and I went out at night. We went out at night, and all these women with no shirts on, like dancing around in front of the White House. And you, whenever I put that up, it always I always get thrown in the lockup for <laughs> while violating community standards because you can't show boobs. Uh, oh, you can't? No, there's no there's no showing there's no showing of um, breasts. Uh, that's against the law. So I, I've put it up a few times and been thrown into um, lo the, the Facebook, Instagram, a big house. Oh no. Big bad. No. Friends, this has been wonderful. And you'll have to come back again when in the next incarnation of the show as you continue to travel around and work together. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, uh, and thank, thank you for having us. Yes, thank you so much for having us. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks, but in the meantime, resist. resist.